Almost 31% mortality is present in uh, globally because of the cardiovascular disease and therefore the known predicting, predicting uh, cardiovascular risk in the 21st century amounts to the known co coronary artery risk factors which we are very well aware of. It. So, but th there is something specific today is that we know that globally Indian population is more prone for coronary artery disease particularly in the younger age. So this is one problem we are facing. The other problem we are facing is that when we do, when we encounter a coronary artery disease and a myocardial infarction patient, just take the history of the patient. You find that most, almost 20% uh, of them they do not have any risk factor. So, but they are presented with a myocardial infarction. But if you further dig into their history, almost 43% have only one risk factor. So that means if you combine both, <coughs> almost 60% of those patients whom you are treating for myocardial infarction do not have any risk factor or one risk factor. That means to say that there should be something more than the risk factor which are known to us. So we have to find out what are the other risk factors which are no, non known to us but we should be, we have to in, uh, encourage to find out and try to treat it. Other important factor is when you look at the myocardial infarction uh, assessment most of the time you see their lipid profile is normal. This is very astonishing. Somebody comes with a myocardial infarction, do a lipid profile, more than 50% of them have a normal lipid profile. That means to say that lipidology alone is not the factor for the risk process. So we have to have, other important thing is there is a beautiful study called Healthy American Women's Study. In this they found that 77% of the cardiovascular event has occurred in an LDL cholesterol less than 160 and 46% occurred in those with LD and cholesterol which is 130 and below. That means most of the patients who had an event had a normal cholesterol also. So therefore it is very important for us to find out what are the other risk factors present. These are the classic risk factors which all of us know. So I don't want to go to the details of it. However, there is a cardiometabolic risk at the globally which has got multiple risk factors which are known that is either an insulin resistance, diabetes or overweight and obesity, abnormal lipids, smoking, hypertension. But one thing which I want to highlight today is the inflammation and to find out what is the reason and why should we uh, concentrate more on inflammation. So the risk factors, we, this is the risk categories because we have to know that when there, there are three risk fact, uh, categories out of which the third group, you can see that if we cannot say that even those patients who do not have any risk, still there is a 10% chance of having an event. So it is very common to find out some of our friends or neighbors having a sudden myocardial infarction, but you try to dig to their history, you find that they don't have a sudden So therefore, this is a very important slide which I want to highlight a lot. The atherosclerosis, the initial lesion starts from the ninth year of age. That means all of us have already got some lesions to occur because it's the first decade of atherosclerosis occurs. That is the initial lesion. And but slowly it becomes a second stage is the fatty streak. The fatty streak and the initial lesions will occur in the first and second decade of life. That then the third one is the intermediate lesion. So till intermediate lesion, it is clinically silent. Though we do not have any symptoms till intermediate lesion. However, from the third decade onwards, the atheroma starts accumulating. So when the atheroma starts accumulating, there will be an intracellular lipid accumulation as well as the core extracellular lipid accumulation. Then it becomes fibroatheroma, that is in the next decade. However, this, if at all, if it's only fibrotheroma, it is stable, then it is very fine. But for some reason, mainly the inflammation, the same fibrotheroma will start the rupture of the plaque occurs, which causes myocardial infarction at the end. Therefore, we have to highlight more on the complicated lesion and why the complication occurs. A silent fatty streak and a fatty uh, intermediate lesion suddenly pops up. Particularly, this is another important thing is when we do an angiogram in most of the time when the patient present with the, uh, the myocardial infarction, we will see two types of lesion. First lesion is you have very small lesion, luminal, but a large thrombus. 
that causes what is called as ST elevation in mind. But the second type of lesion is large atheromatous plaque, but a small thrombus, which is most of the time what we designate as non ST elevation. So, therefore, there should be some reason for a plaque to rupture. What should be the reason for plaque rupture and how to prevent the plaque rupture? Because a plaque itself, when it is stable, it can cause only a chronic disease, but it cannot cause an acute lesion. Therefore, there should be some reason because of the inflammation, the plaque which is having a stable plaque <coughs> uh, cap, fibrous cap, will rupture, inviting the platelets adhesions and causing a hemorrhage and the myocardial infarction. Therefore, there is two things like the God has created the vascular endothelial cell, which has got an anticoagulant mechanism as well as the procoagulant mechanism. There is a fine balance between the two. Because of some reason, more skin because of the inflammation, you have a procoagulant mechanism taking over, causing the myocardial infarction. So, then a plaque which is stable, it may be 20%, 30% plaque, it may be stable plaque suddenly the cap ruptures because of inflammation which leads to the rupture plaque and superficial erosion following which the thrombosis occurs, which occludes the artery completely causing the myocardial damage. So there are various atherothrombosis, the uh, biomarkers as well as the inflammatory mediators which applies in different stages which, uh, and that is one which ha helps for the identifying the marker disease. For example, this is one which the the, uh, the inflammatory markers are given down. So when the plaque is stable, when the plaque becomes unstable, when the plaque ruptures, then the thrombosis occurs and the ischemia or infarction occurs, which leads to necrosis and then the nervi remodeling. So at different stages, we have different inflammatory markers which are present. Now coming to the systemic inflammation, but one thing is very clear: the inflammation increases the level of circulating cytokines which causes the damage to the endothelium and that is causing the atherosclerosis. Therefore, the circulating cytokines like uh, C-reactive protein or tumor necrosis alpha factor and interleukin 6 are play a major role in that. Then there are something called non-novel metabolic biomarkers. This is very important because there are two factors for an atherosclerosis. One is a lipid one is the bioinflammatory markers. So normally what happens is we, when we assess atherosclerosis clinically, we look into the lipidology of the patient. When we say that, but I already I told you beginning, 50% of the myocardial infarction is occurring in those patients who have a normal lipid. So is it required for us to guess? It is important for us to know the lipid, lipidology of the patient. But in addition to that, nowadays we are uh, focusing more on novel metabolic markers. What are these? The HSCRP has gained a lot of importance nowadays. I am going to tell you about that. The apoprotein B as well as the apoprotein B to A1 ratio and the non-HDL has scored over. Now non-HDL there is a lot of importance being given. Non-HDL means the total cholesterol minus HDL. Actually this is the one which represents the atherogenic uh, risk. And another thing is it is easy for us to measure. You need not measure on fast. Any time it can measure it, non HDL actually represents the atherogenesis. Therefore, we give a lot of importance to this. Now, coming to the other uh, biomarkers of inflammation, these are not biomarkers, but it is difficult for us to measure in our clinical settings. So, we do not uh, measure it, and because of variability of lab to lab with the person uh, to person, we do not have a standardized measurement of the, these biomarkers. However, when you look at this, I have already told that the immune response which causes the inflammatory cytokines, causing the vascular endothelial dysfunction and atherosclerosis. Now, this uh, article, which is the Jupiter trial, which appeared in 2008, made a lot of difference when we are looking at the primary prevention. Because somebody will come to you tomorrow, a 40 year old young man says that I do not have any disease, I do not have any symptoms. This is my lipid. Do you want me to start and stop? That's what he will ask. Me. So, we have to have some parameters. We cannot just say, uh, I have seen many people, uh, for general physician or uh, the practitioner, simply look at the lipidology and say that you start some statin because including statin, any drug has its own limitation and the complications are the, uh, the side effects of it. 
Therefore, none of the drugs should be started without any. So, we have we got any answers to that? Yes, we have some answers to now. This uh, this answered us because this trial showed that it is almost 18,000 patients were followed up for five years in this Jupiter trial, which is a primary prevention trial. Which was the Rosewood statin was started in normal individuals. It showed a definite incidence. I don't want to go to the details of it. Look at this ACC AHA criteria. In 2003, they said HSCRP, we need not measure it. But they upgraded their criteria. In 2010, they said, yes, there is some role for HSCRP. But in 2013, they have still upgraded. Now it comes to the second to be level of evidence to say that HSCRP, we have to measure it regularly. So now the criteria comes is, now when, how to start or when to start a patient, is it required to start a patient in a normal individual, not patient, normal individual, any statin role. So what we are doing is that we look at their MDL, we look at their non-HDL. If you can do an apoprotein B, it's very good. Otherwise, at least do the HSCRP and look at the ratio. This has clearly shown that if somebody's HSCRP is more than 3 and if somebody's LDL is more than 160, it's a strengthening case for you to start uh, starting as a primary prevention. This is, I'm telling you about primary prevention in those who are normal, not disease patients. Therefore, this clearly said that if somebody has got more than 160 LDL and more than 3 of uh, C-reactive protein, the relative risk of cardiovascular disease is very high. Therefore, you are justified in starting the uh, statin. At the same time, you can, all of you carry a smartphone to download the uh, 10 years CV risk, that is atherosclerosis, AS CVD risk, you can download. And in front of patient only, you can finish up. You just enter the data accordingly, you will get the 10 year risk as well as a lifetime risk. If it is more than 7.5, please start on statin. This is how we look at different level of when to start if statins are different. Now coming to that, now coming to the inflammation. Now statin is very good because it is has not only an anti-lipid, it has got five to six uh, other type of uh, uh, the action. Like it is a antioxidant, it is anti-inflammatory, it stabilizes the plaque, and so many points are there. Now the inflammation occurs very nicely. This is what the activated monocyte and an LDL. The LDL which oxidizes, the small LDL, the one which triggers the inflammation. The moment that the triggering of the inflammation occurs, the one with monocyte gets converted to macrophages through an NFKB pathway and the oxidized LDL acts at the dendritic cells. So therefore, you have foam cells and then the inflammatory mediators which trigger off to an adhesive molecules like VCAM and ICAM which causes an inflammation, a vicious cycle of inflammation. So there are two pathways here. One is NFKB pathway, another one is NF9 pathway. So we are looking at that the innovations occurring in these two pathways. Now that means to say that we have statins with us very good, but we have seen clinically the many patients who are on aspirin, on statin, and any beta blocker still they come with a coronary event. So there is no answer. That means to say that the statins can prevent only 30% to 35% of the coronary event. That means the majority of the event which in normal, in the low card, high dose statin also sometimes cannot prevent it uh, coronary. That is because the inflammatory part of it is not looked up. Therefore, nowadays the innovation is occurring in this area because in addition to the statin which has become a standard uh, drug therapy for atherosclerosis, we have to look at the other two pathways like NFKB pathway and NFLA. In this pathway, what is happening is that you are trying to uh, minimize the oxidized LDL which triggers the inflammation. Therefore, you are trying to find out is there any drug, is there any innovation in these pathways. Now, what is happening is like we look at the two pathways, we have got some uh, answers for that. One is the NFKB anti-inflammatory is the very well known curcumin which is turmeric. So, all over uh, in household, it's a very important household. Turmeric is used for our uh, uh, 
day-to-day uh, uh, food preparation, but we do not know uh, that it is so important for us to have a turmeric because it's a very good drug which acts at NFKB anti-inflammatory pathway. Now, at the same time, there are some uh, the Cadilla is also making some innovative technique of developing a 3-HAA anti-inflammatory metabolite which will help to minimize the inflammation caused by the oxidized LDL. So, the current uh, targets are uh, status, of course it is there. Then there are something called uh, TNF inhibitors which are going to come. It is in phase 3 trial, where in which uh, canakinumab has been tried. It is an anti-inflammatory TNF inhibitor. And uh, of course, uh, methotrexate in a small dose is also been tried as an anti-inflammatory. Of course, we have the antiplatelet, AC inhibitors, all those things are there already and the statin is well proved. But the novel targets are these two, which I have want to highlight. That is on 3-HAA anti-inflammatory metabolite as well as the NFKB anti-inflammatory metabolite. Now, coming to this, uh, briefly, the kinerunan pathway is by the tryptophan, uh, tryptophan metabolism, which causes uh, the 3-hydroxyanthranic acid is the target. And uh, this has been shown that recently, that if you try to tackle this 3-HAA pathway, it can have a good response on the lipid metabolism as well as the, the inflammatory action. So there are these three HAA effect is seen on lipids because it also significantly reduces the lipid burden by one third to two third levels. So therefore, three HAA not only acts on the lipid, it also reduces the infiltration of the CD4 T cells in atherosclerotic lesions. This is also well proved now. Therefore, a lot of emphasis is on this drug to be developed. I think the Cadilla is making some headway in this way and therefore that may be helpful because PHAA is an intermediate product and it has clinically benefits in reducing the atherosclerosis, BLDL and uh, chylomicron as well as the vascular inflammation. At the same time, it also increases the HDL cholesterol. The, the NFKB pathway is just to say that it's a inflammatory st stimuli which causes the activation of IKKB and uh, that's how the, uh, the ash molecule becomes active and because of that there is a translocation into the nucleus and which releases the inflammatory mediators and which in turn causes the pro-inflammatory cytokines and that causes the adhesion molecule. This is how the inflammation occurs and the atherosclerotic plaque which is stable becomes unstable and the plaque ruptures causing the event. So curcumin which is a turmeric is very helpful in this way also because it prevents the activation of NFKB pathway and it prevents the translocation to the nucleus. At the same time it prevents the release of the inflammatory mediators and that is how it prevents it also improves the uh, uh, not only improves the inflammatory uh, markers uh, reduction, but it also significantly reduces the cholesterol. Therefore, there are other promising therapies which are going to come. That means we, in a, uh, we are not only looking at the lipid, we are also looking at the inflammation. So when we are looking at the inflammation, we have PHAA uh, in, in, uh, anti-inflammatory drugs to be, uh, to be developed shortly. At the same time, we have PNF factor inhibitors are also going to come and at the same time we have methotrexate and cyclosporine which can be used in a small dose it can be uh, some studies have shown that uh, the inflammation subclinical vascular inflammation can be reduced by the low dose methotrexate also so therefore we are I am mean, concluding today's talk that the despite optimum therapy of the current drugs including the statin one third of the patient still have a risk factor for, the, uh, for them to develop a atherosclerotic coronary, coronary artery disease. Therefore, tackling the inflammation <coughs> is a potential to improve the cardiovascular outcome further. At the same time, we are, we are developing some of the newer molecules which are going to come will help us to tackle the inflammation, which is also tackled by the statin, which is of white spread usage at this point.